The big question you raised at the end, and we could spend some time with that, how do you make ultimate judgments and determinations like this one is right, you know? Well, you, you hinted at it a bit there by saying, well, look, many, many people have looked worked on this for a very, very long period of time. And in some sense, it's a living document, yeah. right? Because, right? Because it does have to be, it, the Bible just doesn't exist as a book on a shelf. The problem with the scientific viewpoint, technically speaking, is that it's amoral within it within, within its own within its, within its own confines. But by definition, it strives not to address issues of value. Now, it can't help it because scientists have to investigate some things and not others, so value enters into it. But by its own nature, science can't answer and tries not to answer questions of value. Now, it gets more complicated when you look at um, work like the primatology I discussed earlier, the origin of morality in animals and game playing, say, among rats, that starts to move into the domain of morality to some degree. But the problem with science is that it doesn't, it strips out all subjective meaning. It's designed to do that. And that leaves everyone at a loss about what to do with the world of value. And I do believe that um, stories in particular uh, address the world of value. That's their function. That's and, and the world of value is the world that that we act in. It, it, they're guides to action. Well, I come across it all the time in my work on the internet. So I have you know dialogues with people that interact with my videos, and they'll say things like, "Well, the sciences give us access to the truth." Period. The scientific method. That's how you get to the truth. And I'll say, "So Hamlet." tells you nothing true. Plato tells you nothing true. Uh, T.S. Eliot's poetry tells you nothing true. I mean, who, who would believe that except the most ideologically scientific person? But see, my, my fear is a lot of young people are in the grip of that. They're in the grip of a real ideological science. They don't know how to think their way out of it. And so they, they just abandon the attempt, but it leaves them nowhere. What you were doing, though, is you're showing a way out, and and there there is a way out, and it's it's by you know an introduction into the great masters of these texts to show you how they function. Um, that's what a good preacher ought to be doing, you know. So let let me throw another objection, then, and this is another stumbling block, I think, and I think this emerges yeah. in postmodernism in particular, um, because the postmodernists yeah. there's reasons the way, for the for their manner of thinking they're, they're, yeah. they're. so one reason yeah. is so uh, artificial intelligence researchers discovered in the early 1960s that um, perceiving the landscape was much more difficult than anybody had ever suspected originally it was sort of felt that objects were just there in some simple way and the complicated mm -hmm. computational problem would be how to move among the obvious objects but it turned out that it's really, really difficult to perceive the environment. There's an infinite or near infinite number of ways that you can perceive even a finite set of objects. So, um, and that means there's there's an, a multitude of potential interpretations for every set of events. And so that 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 was a radical discovery in the computational world. But the same discovery basically occurred at the same time in the world of literary analysis, for the same reason is that every text is susceptible to a an inordinately large number of interpretations, and it's not easy to identify the canonical interpretation. And maybe the canonical interpretation isn't canonical, it just serves power, for example. And that would be, you know, religion as the opiate of the masses or, or religion as a political tool. And I think that takes things far too far. But there's a real problem here is that if you divorce the narrative from the objective world, and say, well, the narrative is valuable because it gives us a guide to value. Then you have another problem is, which in instantly, which is, okay, which narrative? And how do we make a hierarchy of value among narratives? We would say Hamlet is deeper than um, Harlequin romance. Right. But trying to specify why that is and what deep means is very, very difficult. And you might say, well, the Bible is the deepest of all narratives, but that still big, begs the question. Well, compared to Buddhist writings, say, compared to the Upanishads, um, or compared to any long-term complex mythology that's developed over thousands and thousands of years, what makes it canonical? Why is it preferable to Shakespeare, for example? And so, well, I, I, so perhaps I could get you to address that because that's a 
vicious problem. There's a lot there. And I'll start with your opening remark about postmodernism, because I quite agree with you. Uh, I'm not simply anti-postmodern. In fact, I wrote a book called Toward a Post-Liberal Catholicism, where I took in a lot of the insights of the postmoderns, one of which is, as you quite correctly say, a sort of legitimate perspectivalism, that we never get reality you know, too cool. I right? just open my eyes, there's reality. Again, that's Lonergan. It's only a properly constituted subjectivity that, it, that opens the door to the properly objective. But one of those ways of properly constituting your subjectivity is to put your subjectivity within a community of discourse. So it's never the case that I simply intuit the way things are and end of the argument. No, it's as, as Lonergan says, it's not the cogito. That was the trouble with the Enlightenment. It's the cogitamos. It's always we think. And that means I have my perspective. I bounce it off your perspective. You bounce it off somebody else's. We have a, a disciplined and structured conversation. And in that process, all the different aspects of the real begin to emerge. Or like my intellectual hero, John Henry Newman, said the contents of a real idea is equivalent to the sum total of its possible aspects. That's about 1870, he says that, which is really an extraordinary thing because he anticipates in many ways the phenomenologists. You know, when they talk about uh, walking around an object and to intuit its essence thereby. And the walking around is not just I walk around, but you're walking around and someone else is walking around. And we're all ch exchanging our points of view. And again, I'd bring this into line with Catholicism, which has always stressed the communitarian element that we know precisely in the community of the church. Now, linked to the Bible, the Bible is never like, just open it up. You're a single subjective uh, uh, viewer. Now you take in its meaning. Well, no, we've always said the Bible is read within the church in this long interpretive tradition where I'm bouncing it off of Augustine's perspective, who got it from Origen, who now throws it to Thomas Aquinas, who now brings it to Newman, and then through preachers and teachers, through the saints. So you've got the technical intellectual interpretation of the Bible. Then you have the saints who in many ways, they, they embody the Bible. So I'm going to read a lot of the biblical stories in light of Francis of Assisi, in light of Teresa of Calcutta, et cetera. So I, I like that side, if you want, of the postmodern, which is much more attuned to the uh, communal way in which we come to know things. Um, the big question you raise at the end, and we could spend some time with that, how do you make ultimate judgments and determinations like this one is right, you know? Well, you, you hinted at it a bit there by saying, well, look, many, many people have looked worked on this for a very, very long period of time. And in some sense, it's a living document, yeah. right? Because, right? because it does have to be, it, the Bible just doesn't exist as a book on a shelf. It's, yeah. it's a, a pattern of meaning within a context and the context has to be taken into account. Um, so you say, well, there's a powerful context for its interpretation. It's also a fundamental text in that the Bible is implicit in all sorts of other great texts like Shakespeare or yeah. any anything that's a product of Judeo-Christian culture it, that's a deep product is deeply affected by the Bible. So it's there implicitly whether you like it or not. And so yeah. it has to be taken seriously, I would say, even if you don't b believe it, but then to the degree that you believe the central axioms of Western culture, you have to wonder how much of what's biblical you do end up believing because of its implicitness. 